Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Noreen Plunkett. I've been writing documentation for about a decade now, which is, you know, a very long time in internet time. Um, I don't have business cards, but my usual title at work is a geek to English translator. And more, more recently, I've been known as a, a force multiplier. Um, this is the second time we've had Apache Con in my hometown. In 2006, we threw it in Dublin. Uh, and I've been living here in Portland for the last year and a half. Um, I've been working on documentation at Apache since about 2005. Uh, and although I was always very interested in science and maths and, and that kind of stuff, English was my absolutely least favorite subject. The only thing I liked less than English was classics, which was like English, but more writing and in harder languages. Uh, luckily, you don't have to be a good writer to write good documentation. Um, and so that's why I'm here, to, to give you some of the things that I've learned over, over my time. I've written documentation everywhere from Microsoft to Google, um, from Apache to, uh, to the Irish government. And uh, if you don't know why documentation might be useful, you may be in the wrong room. Uh, Park's Tomcat clustering talk, I can highly recommend. He's an excellent speaker. Um, but I had a great plan for this talk. I had it all written out. I had my citations. I had all sorts of research. Um, and then we had a bar camp on Sunday. And like so much in open source, you get together and you start talking to people, and suddenly the whole plan changes. Um, so this is going to be a slightly less formal talk than I had planned. Um, so if you have questions, feel free to just raise your hand. We'll get a mic to you. Please don't ask the question till you get the mic, because that way we can catch it all on the recording. And if you take your seats nice and quickly, that way we can get me on the recording and not the back of your head. Um, so good documentation saves time for everybody. It saves time for your users. They learn what they need to get what they want to do done. Uh, it saves time for you. You spend less time answering questions on IRC. Spend less time whining on IRC about the questions you're having to answer on IRC spend less time having group therapy about all the whining that's going on, and so on and so forth. Um, but writing documentation will also improve your code straight up. Uh, a study of documentation that's in the list of sites, and again, these will all be online later, um, study from McGill found that working on documentation actually led directly to improvements in code quality, which I think is pretty cool. Um, but most importantly, if you write even vaguely passable documentation, you will win more friends than you can imagine. Uh, I've been a professional writer for several years, and as I said, I've been contributing documentation at Apache uh, for longer than that. And I can honestly say that on every mailing list I've ever joined, every IRC channel I've hung out at, every conference I've gone to, there is nothing to make you friends like saying, oh yeah, I write the docs. <laughs> um, but like a blank page, getting started on documentation can be a bit scary. So we're going to spend the next hour or so figuring out what you need, building up a little bit of a structure to make things easier, and looking at where you can get quick wins and, and easy starts. There are some things, though, that we're not going to look at. They're important, that's fine, but they're more on the formal side, and really, it's easy to get bogged down in the details. Um, generally, don't worry too much about your grammar. If you're having an argument about whether or not a sentence is correctly structured, scrap it and rewrite it. Don't worry about whether your verbs and your nouns are matching and, and all of that. That's OK. Just, just write the sentence a different way. Have those arguments, fine. Have them on English.stackoverflow. That's great. If that's your passion, brilliant. But don't let it stop you from writing documentation. Um, and again, these, these are sort of deliberately written to be as awful as they could be. Um, most of the stuff you run against really isn't that hard to read, even if your grammar is a bit off. Uh, punctuation, same again. If you're not sure about whether a sentence is clear, rewrite it. If a sentence is getting long, split it up. That's OK. Um, if you really want a background on basic writing and good English, I'm a big fan of the Oxford Guide to Plain English. Um, there are so many books and guides out there you could be reading as long as you like, but please start writing. So the first question when it comes to documentation is who is going to write it? And the obvious answer is anybody can. And the most common corollary to that is anybody but me. 
Um, and again, the McGill study that I was talking about earlier actually found that having a separate documentation team led to a poorer experience for everyone. Uh, the docs teams and the users became frustrated because docs tended to lag behind code more severely than on projects where code and docs were written by the same team. Uh, and the code quality suffered because of that divide. Developers were less aware of usability issues. They were less likely to thoroughly test their code. The documentation was often written based on what the developers said the code was going to do before they wrote the code. And what the developers say the code is going to do before they write it and what the code actually does when they're finished writing it are very rarely the same thing. Um, it's pretty common to use documentation as an entry point to contribution to any open source project. And that's great, and it's how I got started doing open source work, and I'm all in favor of it. But you do need to do some prep work if you're going to use that as an on-ramp. Have a list of doc bugs, have a wish list. Really importantly, have some mentoring. Have people who are there and available to help out. Because writing is great, and it's 99% of what you need. But 99% of the frustration comes from, how do I check out? How do I make these changes in the XML? How do I build the XML and make sure that I haven't broken everything? What do I do with that patch? Do I send it inline or do I attach it to the mail? Those are the hurdles that are so small and so easy to get over once you've been doing it for a while, but they are a huge frustration for newbies. Um, the best time to write documentation is right now. And I give all of, any of you who have your laptops open, if you are writing documentation, you have my full blessing to continue doing so. Keep at it. That's great. I don't, you can sit on my talk and write away. That's fine. Um, the most important thing is to get the things out of your head and onto paper or electrons. Um, as long as the documentation is in your head, it's not accessible to anyone else. And that means your users can't get at it, but it also means that other people can't help you improve it. Whatever you write doesn't need to be complete or final, and in fact, it will never be complete or final. Happily for us, our readers have access to the source code, the mailing list, the IRC channel, whatever other resources we have. But if you write things down, people will bug you less often, and they'll have some chance to contribute back. Now, I have a question for all of you. I'm Irish. I've been at this a while. Am I speaking too quickly? Great. Just checking in. So what is documentation anyway? Um, back to the formal part of the presentation that I had prepared and written up since about October. Um, writers often divide docs into three categories based on the needs that they serve. So we have conceptual documentation, task-based documentation, and reference documentation. Conceptual docs are probably the hardest kind for a newbie to start off with. But conversely, if you already know the system you're talking about, they can be the easiest to write. They cover the why of the system, the overview, the here's the idea, here's what we were trying to achieve with this project or piece of software or module or whatever it is. Reference docs cover more of the what. They're for someone who already understands the concept and probably knows how to use the system, but needs a quick answer to a question. What are the flags I need to use to untar this file. Uh, can I use my old 60 watt power supply with my new shiny 45 watt laptop? What's the argument I need to force SSH to use an IPv4 connection? Uh, unlike conceptual and task-based docs, a lot of these can be automatically generated. So you can just have your Java doc or your Py doc throw out this, this reference documentation a lot of the time. Um, unfortunately, we only have a little bit of time today, so we're not going to go into all of those systems, but I'm happy to talk about those outside later. Um, and then the third type of documentation, procedural docs, are your how-tos, your step-by-steps, your tutorials. These can also be your video casts and your podcasts. They don't actually have to be written text. Um, these are generally easier than conceptual docs for a newbie to write, and any of you who were in Deb's talk earlier and saw that curve of where do you write the documentation, you know, I'm starting down here and I know absolutely nothing about the system to have the whole thing done. When you're starting down here and have absolutely no idea what you're doing, writing down every step you take, even if it ends up being backtracking and I didn't need to do that or I did that wrong or I got to step six and then realized I should have done something else at step three, is actually a good way of getting a procedural doc started. 
Um, where do we put our docs? Again, this is another thing that I think has changed. Yeah, sorry, question. Grab the mic, please. Thank you. How can we persuade our users to submit uh, to us uh, document uh, the uh, trouble uh, that they have reading our documentation right up front? How can you persuade users to, to tell you about the trouble they're having reading the documentation? Right, so the idea is that uh, new people are not afflicted by the curse of knowledge, and we want to uh, uh, exploit that. And, yes. Uh, and so in order to do that, uh, they, we have need new people to actually start writing documentation or to at least give us some uh, idea about what is confusing. Yeah, I've found hanging out on the IRC channel is great for that because we've got We've got the documentation written down, and somebody comes in and asks a question that you think, of course, that's an easy thing. People do that 10 times a day. That's no problem. It's documented right here. And the user comes back to you and goes, but I can't. And, and at that point, it takes a little more question. You say, but, I, but you can't what? Um, I, had, I used to work at tech support in a hospital. And at one point, I had a doctor phone me up and tell me that he couldn't read his email. Um, and, and it took us a series of questions. It took us probably seven minutes to work out that his computer was sitting in three inches of water, and he did have the good sense not to turn it on. But what he said to me was, I can't read my email. <laughs> um, and so that, that troubleshooting questioning, which is the same for you know, sysadmins troubleshooting why the system isn't working, is also what you need to discover what's What's wrong with your docs? OK, what are you trying to do? What does the doc say to do? How did you do that? OK, what went wrong? What did you see? Um, that's how I'd suggest doing it. Um, so where do you put your documentation? Did you have a question? Sorry. Oh, I was, like, I was thinking about that. Like, if, if you have something that's a one-on-one -on -one that you have people read all the time, then putting a giant thing at the top that invites people to submit, like, Yep. Yeah, you can get these. These need improvement. That's a great plan. If you have something that people are reading all the time, um, or particularly something that's your, you know, the first, f my first, whatever, my first deployment, my first web page, putting something at the top saying, please send us your comments. Having a comment field at the bottom saying, did this work for you? Tell us what did or didn't work. Having a call out to say, please email us here and tell us how this went for you. Um, positively and negatively, because it's really great feedback for a documentation team to hear, yes, I went through this, I read this doc, and it, I got it working. Um, all too often we hear the complaints and not the compliments. So any of those kinds of call-outs are great to have. Yeah. Yep. I think like no. And for documentation, it is overwhelming a bad thing in the sense that, like, especially when you're targeting diverse audience, that you don't know, like especially taking your doctor's example and the phone call one. I, I run into the other side of it. Like when I get mad when a call center person makes me do all these simple stuff, find a button to figure out a power, and I just say, just tell me power of my laptop. I'll figure it out. I don't want them to tell me where the power button is. Go put your finger there. Yeah. So different audiences have different needs for documentation, and we'll get to that a little bit later. Um, the where of, where of where do you put your documentation um, has changed drastically in the last. Even, even in the last year, um, when I started writing documentation, we had these silos. We had, you know, the HTTPD docs are on, httpd.apache.org slash docs. If you want the PHP docs, you go to PHP's website. If you want Perl doc, it's, it's in Perl. And, and nowadays, that's no longer where we look for information. Stack Overflow. Stack Overflow is the canonical documentation for so many open source projects. Um, blogs, so much documentation is on blogs. We're no longer really browsing the web. So many of us now are searching. Uh, and that has advantages and disadvantages, but it is the reality we're living in right now. And so where you put your docs in terms of a hierarchy is much less important than it was. How you arrange those docs among themselves still has great value and use, making it easy to find the connections between the conceptual and the reference stuff that goes together is great. Um, but whether it's on a wiki or a static web page or wherever it is, is no longer worth spending a whole lot of time agonizing over. 
well, microphone seems far away, but I'm pretty loud. I can repeat. Um, well, I just want to tee off of your remark. If everyone's searching that SEO is important, I've had a few experiences in Apache projects where relatively obvious Google queries yielded astonishingly unhelpful Google results. Yeah. Uh, and that's not, that's not, that's, that's a certain black art of its own. Yeah, so the comment was that if everybody is searching, then SEO becomes important. And I think the Apache Docs team have had a change of heart in the last few years as we've realized that yes, everybody is now searching and SEO to some degree is important. Um, I would say if you're, if you're going to go for that kind of thing, please don't search for SEO. Go to something like Google's Webmaster Tools and look at what they're suggesting. Make sure you have in the metadata your canonical docs represented as canonical. Use redirects that actually send a 3.0 code rather than a 200 and just redirect you. Um, yes, that stuff is important, but somewhat outside the scope of this talk. Yep. We could mention that if you know how to make that stuff work, that's another valid contribution. Yes, all contributions are valid and much loved. And if you can make that stuff work, infrastructure will be happy to talk to you. The docs teams will be happy to talk to you. Let's get it working. Um, the, the slight exception to it doesn't really matter where you put it is probably conceptual documentation, which tends to be most useful if it's well curated. Um, it doesn't need to be updated terribly often usually. The, the concepts behind your technology tend not to shift as rapidly as, say, the specific API calls you might or might not be making. Um, and it's usually pretty easy to tell if a task-based document is out of date because you start stepping through the tasks and it fails. Um, but if, if a conceptual doc is out of date, that's harder to recognize as somebody coming in and reading it. And so that stuff needs to be reviewed by somebody who has the expertise on hopefully a relatively regular basis. Um, ideally, of course, all of your documentation would be kept in some kind of a version control. Um, and ideally, you would have copies of it somewhere that is not going to disappear at the whim of, you know, it fell off the front page of Hacker News. Um, but we do what we can. Um, and task documentation, again, because it's nice and easy to see when the task documentation stops working, should ideally be easy to update and I, e ideally easy for newcomers to contribute to or to change. Um, when, I can, when I come into a project, I'm, you know, I clone the Git repo, I install whatever I need to install, I realize that package no longer exists or has a new name, I find what it is I need to install and I install. It would be great if I can just very quickly say, here's a patch, pull request, send an email, whatever it is. And the other thing I would encourage anybody who is already in a project to do is accept bug reports in whatever form they come in. If somebody sends you a tweet saying, this thing on this page is wrong, don't send them off and make them go through Bugzilla because honestly, and I say this as I'm, I'm pretty confident I'm one of the younger people in this room, Bugzilla may have been fine when you were my age. We have new expectations now. Um, so accept bug reports on Facebook, on Twitter, people nabbing you in the hallway. It's fine if somebody nabs you in the hallway to say to them, please send me an email or write it down. I have occasionally written bug reports on my hand um, because if you just tell me and I haven't got anything written down, it's not going to happen. But if it's written down, take it. Um, a, a bug report really is the first contribution and uh, it's great to encourage those people and, and get them hooked. Uh, so again, the how was, there was a lot of sort of writing theory in here involving um, different ways of getting started and so on, but get started, write it down, talk to each other. When you're talking to each other, somebody pull out your phone, because now we all have phones that can do this, and just record explaining the new module to somebody else. Just record it, and if you want to make a podcast, great, we have people who would love to talk to you about that. If you just want to type up what you've said, put it down in some kind of a slapdash doc, get started one way or the other. Um, were you with us at the doc sprint at Google? 
by the other the other great way of getting started is copying copy the stuff that's that's already out there that's on blog posts that's on stack overflow and so on be careful a little bit about the license but by using this a team of 24 of us i think we were six four right four writers and 20 engineers managed to write four books in three days last october um, so so that can be a really really great way to get documentation done the information is largely out there um, the first principle of good technical writing, once we go from getting something down to getting something good, is to make it simple. Good technical writing should be essentially invisible. Readers should be thinking about the ideas, about the technology, about the solutions, about what they're going to do with this cool new stuff, and not about your writing. Nobody is going to curl up in front of the fire with a cup of cocoa and a technical manual. Actually, that's not true. I have writers tell me this all the time. Writers are the only people who are going to curl up in front of the fire with a cup of cocoa and a technical manual. And it's very important that we have our communities to do that, and I'm fully supportive of that. But the rest of the room are not going to do that. Um, it's not that your audience can't understand complex writing. It really isn't. We have some of the best and the brightest here. They can understand the worst things that I can write. But they shouldn't have to. And the second principle is that no document is ever finished. That's OK. Creating a document in theory happens in three phases. You think about it, you write it, and you revise it. The problem is that then you revise it, and you revise it, and you revise it. Um, and don't bother trying to get to the end. Get to good enough. Don't even necessarily bother getting to good enough. Get to OK. That's fine. Somebody else can come along, and somebody else will do a better job than you can by coming along later and looking at it with a fresh set of eyes. Uh, at, at my day job, and I hope I don't get in trouble for saying this, but at my day job, we discovered just before our last release that there were two sections in the documentation that had title, I mean, they had, they had a meaningful title. The, the one I remember off the top of my head was creating a user password. And uh, the content for that section was, content goes here. That had been in our user manual for at least one major version and like several minor revisions within that. And nobody had spotted it because the writer had gone, right, we need a creating user password section. They had made you know, the boilerplate for it. They had gotten busy. They'd gone off and done something else. The same writer had reviewed their work, but they knew that they were going to write that. They just hadn't quite gotten. So it's OK. Leave it, put it down, let someone else to look at it. Um, so when you're getting started, um, again, we're back to sort of slightly the more formal stuff. There are some good questions you can start off with for any document. Um, I learned them as, who is my audience, what is the purpose of this document, and what will my audience be able to do after reading this document? Um, when you're doing formal technical writing, you often have an identifiable audience. You have a contract to provide you know, a document for the end user who's going to be putting the batteries into the toy at Christmas, or the electrician who's going to be installing you know, the fuse box in the house, or whatever it is. Um, even within IT, you sometimes have reasonably clearly defined audiences, end users, developers, sysadmins, implementers, various permutations of that. Writing for open source, you often don't have anything that clear. Um, and a lot of people will come looking for different things in the same docs, and they'll come looking for things you never intended them to come looking for. The best suggestion I can give you is pick an audience. Pick one. Make one up. In the same way that product managers have their user stories, you also need your user stories. Decide who you're writing for. Write for them. Link off to other things that say, if you're not already at this level, here's where you can get started. If you've already got all this stuff down, here's where you can find more information. But don't try and write for everybody in the same doc. It'll end up annoying you and annoying your readers. 
You'll find out soon enough if the audience you've picked is the wrong one or if you need to write a second document for another audience. People are really good at complaining, especially people who are getting something for free. Um, so do we have any more questions? I can, yep. Yeah. Uh, is there, are there any behavioral trends or anything like you know, if the developers are there, they can go to the keys, but you know, if the users want to first quickly get and get their like thing in a short time span, like sometimes you say three clicks, someone doesn't want to keep clicking until they find what they want. So based on the audience or anything, we need to create, tweak it like on the website or prominently, we need to give a quick introduction. Okay, so the, the question I think is, are there any best practices for where you put the document or how you allow people to navigate to the document based on the audience of the document. Um, I think I go back I go back partly to my assertion that nobody browses anymore, people just search. I do give the caveat though that coming into a project new, and I still find this with the HTTPD docs, I have great trouble finding where is the developer's guide for the software and where is the developer's guide for the docs. And so if you have projects that are different, that operate differently, it's worth making that very clear. If, if it's all the same project, then I think you don't need to worry quite so much about it. Three clicks is, is great if you can do it, but if it means you have a page that's just this big long list of links and, and there isn't a sort of a narrative guiding people through that, it's no help. Um, yeah, m make it clear. Make it clear what they're finding, perhaps more than worrying about click, click, click. Okay. So uh, this is just an example of some of the questions we could ask for a hypothetical document. Um, I think I actually wrote this back when uh, when we worked together. <laughs> <laughs> which, is, which is approximately a million years ago. But um, who are you writing for? What background do they have? What background do they need? What topics do you need to cover? Um, do you need to, sorry, oops. So yeah, who are you writing for? Um, what background do they need? Do you need to teach them about the calendaring program that you're using, or do you need to teach them about scheduling resources? So for example, at my current job, we have a vacation calendar, which in our current calendaring system is technically a room. And so you book the room for while you're on vacation. Um, do you need to teach them about local, local etiquette? So for example, people should block off certain times if they're remote working and they're going to be sleeping, say, in the evenings. I don't know. When, when you have a company that's distributed around the world, occasionally you end up with 5 a.m. meetings and it's just a matter of somebody didn't. Sometimes it's somebody knows that they're doing that and they're just really, you know, that's, that's when it's got to be because it's got to be at a bad time for someone. And sometimes it's, well, I thought you were in San Francisco. Oops. Um, is that, is, is that actually readable? Or should I call out those questions? Yes. Um, it is readable? Yes. Great. Um, the other great thing about starting with these kinds of questions is that if, once you write down the answers to these questions, you have a pretty solid first paragraph. Uh, this is a trick I actually learned back in school, that you have your set piece of questions, you write down the answers to those questions, and then your essay is already started. Um, People who find your doc, if you've answered these questions, can tell pretty quickly whether it's the document they're looking for, um, whether it's suitably advanced, too advanced, um, what they need. Um, on a less formal level, before you get too far in, you need to think not only about who you're, what you're writing, but how you're writing it. Um, are you writing for an audience who are new to the topic and you need to explain terms I, I say always expand acronyms the first time you use them. Um, again, at my current day job, our software has four major components. It has the node controller, which is the NC, the storage controller, which is the SC, the cloud controller, and the cluster controller, which are 
the CLC and the CC. <laughs> right? <laughs> so I suggest that every time you use an acronym, expand it the first time. And then you can go ahead and use the acronym. And that way, somebody who jumps in in the middle of the doc, because let's face it, people do not read your manuals from beginning to end. They jump in at the point where they think they'll probably find the answer they want. And they hope they find it there. And if they don't, they jump somewhere else. This is, this is not a linear path. Um, are you writing for somebody who's maintaining something that's already set up, where you may need to take it into account Sorry. Sorry. Well, you may need to take into account that different people have different configurations. They have different options set. You can't simply tell them, you know, put this in as your config file because they may already have a config file that has options that, that they need. And so you have to say, well, amend your config file this way or add these things or edit these things. Um, are you writing for an audience who are trying to decide whether or not your tool is the right tool or trying to decide between your tool and other tools, in which case they may need to know more about the differences, the similarities, what does your tool do that others don't, and what does your tool lack that others might have. Um, and it's always good to think, what are my audience going to be able to do when I'm finished writing this? Um, going back to the three kinds of documents, the conceptual task and reference, a conceptual doc is likely to have a purpose of illuminating some subject. And once the audience is finished reading, they'll be able to make a decision or see how components fit together. Uh, a task document should be able to guide a user through some or other task. And once they've read it, they'll be able to complete that task, install the software, get the software running, serve pictures of cats on the internet, whatever it is. Um, and a reference doc is obviously to be referred to, hopefully, once the audience has finished reading, they will be able to do whatever they were trying to do before they got sidetracked by having to look up the uh, command line options for your tool. Um, if you're writing in a team, it's worth looking at some more sort of project management-y stuff. What's my deadline? Um, do I have a deadline for a first draft or for reviews? In particular, who's going to do those reviews and what's their deadline? Um, what's going to hold up the documentation? Where am I going to get the information I need to write the doc? Um, what's it going to look like? Is it going to be an HTML page? Is it going to be a PDF? Are we going to print out a book? Um, what's the rough list of contents? Honestly, I credit the, the fact that we were able to write four books in three days to the fact that we spent the first half day working on a table of contents for each of those books. Because once you know what's going to be in there, it's much easier to put it all together. Um, what is the document not going to contain? So topics for another revision, topics for another document, um, topics for a different audience. And again, if it's, if it's in a formal context, who's going to sign off on this being done? Because it shouldn't be you, the writer. A writer is never, ever finished. I've never met a writer who got to the end of their thing and said, I'm done now. It, it just hasn't happened to me. Um, so somebody else needs to say, yep, we're good now. And that can be a time-based deadline. It can be a, you know, we've passed it past three users, and they all managed to do what they were trying to do. But somebody else needs to be the arbiter of, it's ready to go. Um, structure, again, coming back to that idea of the table of contents. A good document isn't just random globs of information thrown together. Uh, ideally, in the preparation stage, you've thought a little bit about where it fits in with other things that already exist or are on the plan to be written. Um, and by the time you've finished a first draft, you should have answers to questions like, what are the major themes it covers? What are the major sections within the doc? How do those relate to each other? Um, what is the logical progression of my document? It, it, Again, people jump in and out of documentation, but there should nonetheless be a sense that if they were to read it from beginning to end, they would have all the information that they needed. They're not going to do that. But if you write it that way, their jumping in and out is much more likely to be successful. Um, and you, don't, you, you won't have all of these things before you start writing. But again, by the time you get to the end of a first draft, you, you should spend some time working on them. 
Um, here's a sort of a sample table of contents. Let me just make sure it all comes up. There we go. Um, that uh, works for actually a surprising number of documents. So you start with what is, what is this document? It's the answers to the questions we, we looked at earlier. Um, an overview of whatever the system is we're dealing with. When you'll need this, that can also include what you've already done to get to this point. And if there are other things that are further down the line, you don't need this document, you, you need to go on to the next one. Um, then we have our steps, which can be as simple as a bullet list or can be chapters and chapters in and of themselves. Um, examples and sample code. Examples are great. People love examples. People love copying and pasting. It's their favorite thing ever. Mm -hmm. um, troubleshooting. What, what can you expect to go wrong? What are the things that commonly trip people up? Um, if, you can, if you can put those caveats in your doc and say, ah, you came, ac you came across this error, that's because you've not enough space in your file system, clear out some space, or whatever it is. Um, that is a section that's often easier to fill in, either at the very beginning, because you're writing this because you keep getting the same questions, or after the doc has been out for a month or two, and people keep going, this doc is great, but I keep getting stuck on step six. Um, and then further information again is, where can you go now? You, you have a web server. Great. Pictures of cats. Um, so, writing. Once you've got the idea of the doc, the shape of the doc, you've got a first draft, get something down. It's the only way to get a first draft. Write. Copy, paste, brainstorm, anything you need, just get writing. Um, write breath first. So write a broad overview before you dig into the details. The details are easier to fill in later and much less useful to your users. Um, if, if they don't have the beginning to end on some level, they can go as far as they like down the whole of step one and then they're nowhere useful. Um, also, you will never have enough time. There, there just is never enough time to finish a document. Um, and so if you have that breath written, it makes things easier for you. Um, complete the overview last. This can seem kind of counterintuitive, but if you're not sure what you're writing, it's easier to write it first and then go back and say, ah, here's the things I wrote. That can also help you with that logical progression and, and help you see, oh, I left out a bit there, or I need to explain this a little more fully. Um, let's see. Other traditional ways to get started, outlining the doc, uh, creating the table of contents like we saw, using templates, copying, pasting, looking at what other docs you have or what docs other projects have. This is especially fun at Apache where all our stuff is Apache licensed and you can just go yoink. Um, do be careful if you're stealing from other people's documentation. Um, but nobody, nobody I've met ever minds really uh, within Apache if you, if you just take their thing. You know, it's nice to put a little attribution at the end. That's fine. Um, if, you can, if you can fork it in your version control and have that history maintained, that's great. If you can't, you know, do it as text anyway. People will, people will be able to follow those lines. Yeah? So just on that, I mean, in source code, the, mm -hmm. the standard uh, thinking is around attribution is to avoid putting developers' names directly in Apache code. Um, to trust that it's in the version control, um, mm -hmm. if anyone needs to, to figure out who wrote what. Yep. Um, but to try to keep the software source code as a community artifact, rather than something somebody goes, oh, such and such wrote it, therefore she or he is the only one who can change it. Yes. That applies to documentation. That absolutely applies. So Brian is talking about the tradition we have at Apache that we don't put uh, individual names in source code. And I would also say, by and large, we've the HTPD docs project have had a few problems with this, but by and large, we try not to put authors' names in 
uh, in our documentation for many reasons, because it's a product of the community, because many people have worked on it and it's not necessarily fair or reasonable or, or community oriented to give one person credit over others. Um, it can discourage people from contributing because there's a sense that this belongs to somebody or, or, or you know, it's, it's their baby and you can't touch it. Um, when I said attribute where you got it from, I actually more meant if you're stealing between projects. So if you're, if you're taking something from the HTTPD project or you're taking something from Tomcat to say that this originated in a different community. Um, but yes, I would, I would generally say avoid attribution uh, of individuals in, in open source projects. It just, this, it's all there. It's, it's saved in the version control. It must be saved in the version control. If people send you patches, put their name in the commit message. Um, but, but it doesn't need to be in the document. And I think, I, th I think the world is a better place if it's not in the document. Uh, now let's go back to where we were before I dropped my laptop. Um, so I think I mentioned simplicity before. Um, but as you get started, be careful to keep your audience in mind. It doesn't really matter who the audience is. But whatever group you've chosen, keep the document simple for them. What's simple for one audience is not necessarily the same as simple for another audience. I work in a company that creates cloud software. Uh, and my mother phoned me while I was at the office a couple of weeks ago. And she said to me, what are you working on right now? Now, I was trying to work on a document explaining how to package virtual machine images so that you could upload them to the cloud and run them in, in the cloud. which. Broadly speaking, can, can we nod if that makes some kind of sense? Yeah, my mother's a midwife. And so I'm standing there going, well, I'm writing a document that explains to people how I can wrap up the things that I have that I want to run on the software that we write and explains to other people how they can wrap up the things that they have that they want to run on the same software and then I sort of more or less gave up because we would have to go way far back to explaining what a cloud was in a virtual machine. Um, but I did write an, an Upgoer 5 blog post about it, which if you're looking for an entertaining description of virtual machine images, uh, the internet will, will provide. My mother is not a stupid lady. My mother is a midwife. She delivers babies day in, day out. She can operate a Doppler ultrasound. She can do all kinds of amazing things. But she doesn't have all of the context that I have. So if there are prerequisites for your documentation, call them out explicitly. Ideally, link to them. Um, if there's context that seems obvious, try to remember what it was like to be a beginner, and then ask a beginner. Uh, if you're writing for people who should already have that context, mention it, link to it if you can, and keep an eye on the questions that come up after you've launched your doc to make sure that your audience really was at the level that you were assuming they were at. And again, don't make your audience do more work than they have to. Consider what they do not need to know. It's very tempting to go into the technically interesting details or the cool thing you discovered but that may not be relevant for this document. Write a new one, write a blog post, talk about it at a conference, whatever you like. Um, get your point across, but this is not the place to convince people of how smart you are. Um, structuring your document is really important. Again, jumping in and out. Nobody is going to read it from beginning to end, but if you pretend like they were, you might help them get to what they need. Most people will at least have the patience to read the table of contents, so make that meaningful. Um, your introduction should ideally let people know whether they're in the right place, whether this is the doc they want, and should explain the motivation for writing the doc, which again will help them learn whether they're in the right place. Um, and your sections ideally should be visually chunked, so it should be easy to see this is a paragraph about creating a new user. This is a paragraph about associating that user with an account. Make it easy to see where they can jump in and out so that they're not jumping in in the middle of a section and going, this makes no sense. Um, 
first half page above the fold, um, you know, the first screen you see on your laptop. Clarify your audience and purpose. State it explicitly, but also convey it with the title. Um, convey it with the table of contents, if you have that on, on this page. Um, imply it by location in a doc set, and we had that question earlier about three clicks. Location is important in context. So if you have a set of user steps, keep those together, have a progression between those user steps, don't suddenly throw in some administration halfway through the user guide. Um, and orient the user as to what they're looking at and where they're going to find the other things they're looking at. Um, if your document has a template that's different to this, this comes up particularly, I found, in design documents. Follow the template. Don't mess with your user's expectations. Um, once you've got into the main part of the document, putting things in some kind of order is useful. If the information can't be found easily, it might as well not be there. Um, there are several axes along which you can order things, and sometimes they'll conflict. Again, try and figure out what your user's expectations are, whether that's by looking at other docs in your set, by looking at the questions you're getting, by looking at the order people are doing things in when they get started. Um, in general, the most important stuff should go first. The basic stuff should go first, and the general stuff should go first. Yep. So I was just wondering about how that uh, applies to when most of our documentation we're writing is either reference documentation or mm -hmm. API doc, uh, excuse me, or tutorial documentation. And the tutorial documentation is fairly straightforward how it ought to be ordered. And the reference documentation, a lot of times, is fairly straightforward how it ought to be ordered as well. That uh, the API itself determines it. So how? Uh, when you say what belongs first, what kinds of uh, criteria are you using? Um, so, for example, in a set of documents, which tutorials come first? Again, a lot of this is obvious, or, or is obvious when you think about it. Um, the one I wrote first is not usually a good one to put first, or is not necessarily a good one to put first. Um, most things, it's pretty easy to see the correct order to put them in once you look at it. Um, yep. Uh, I was going to say an, another thing about uh, setting expectations. If you're doing installation docs, um, if you tell the user exactly how many steps there will be, because uh, people feel tricked if like, they go down and there's five steps on a page and then it's like, oh, now go to another page for the next five. Um, but you tell them there's going to be 10. So you could even, instead of next page, just be like, you're halfway there. Yeah, so the suggestion was for things like installation docs, even for, for any kind of a task based doc where it's, it's do this and this and this and this and this and this and this. Let people know up front how many steps there are. And if your task is divided into subtasks, it's fine to say, you know, here, here are the five things you're going to have to do. You're going to have to, you know, install the software, set up a user run the software, gather the data, analyze the data. And each of those tasks might have five or six steps in, inside them. But if you tell people up front, here's the things you're going to have to do, and then when you get to each one of those subtasks, OK, you're going to have to do five things to install the software. You're going to have to do eight things to get set up with a user, whatever it is. Um, setting expectations is, is really important. As you're putting things in order, and particularly if you're looking at a general to specific or basic to advanced order, remember that level of detail implies importance. More detail implies more importance. And this becomes an issue if you have several different people writing documentation without a whole lot of coordination, because some people just write very detailed documentation, and some people just write very overview -y sort of documentation. And you can end up with something that's really fairly trivial or unimportant, looking like this is the really, you have to understand this thing in order to get this system, when actually it's just that that was written by that guy, and that's just the way he writes. Um, so a consistent level of detail is a useful way to guide a, a reader. It's not a hard and fast rule, 
But if you can look at your document or your document set through a lens of, of you know, wor how many words this gets means how important it is, and just see if there's anything that's disproportionately emphasized or de-emphasized. Um, obviously, exceptions include the introduction, which is typically shorter, um, and, and procedural or reference material, which tends to just be as long as it needs to be. Um, what you do about problems with the level of detail or, or, or disparities in the level of detail can vary. Sometimes you can reorganize the content or split things into two parts. Um, sometimes you'll need to make different documents with different levels of focus, or sometimes you can leave it as it is. Uh, taking feedback from your audience. Nowadays, we have systems that will allow us to put comments directly on the documentation pages. Use those systems. They are the best thing that's happened to documentation in a long time. Um, and make your documentation readable. I got something from our marketing department last week. And I didn't actually realize that the Flesh Kincaid grade level system of scoring documentation, which allows us to, to see you know, how, how hard it is to read a piece of documentation, I had assumed that it went up to 12. This was a Flesh Kincaid reading level of 18. could read it. I have a master's degree. <laughs> but really, we shouldn't put our users through that. Not only should we not put our users through that, anybody who's throwing that into Google Translate because they're using our software and reading our docs in another language is going to have a hell of a time. If you, can, if you can aim for a reading level, and there's, there's plenty of tests online, if you can aim for a reading level of about a fifth or sixth grade, that's great. If you're up to about eighth grade, that's probably fine. Any higher than that, and you're just being mean to your users. Don't do that. Um, don't, don't create a wall of words either. Split things into paragraphs, into sections. Give it headings. Make it look nice and inviting. Um, and if you've gotten this far, get input from other people. Get other people to look at it and read it. What makes sense to you and sentence constructions that look fine to you are not always as easy for, for somebody who's not inside your brain. Um, and yeah, visual cues. So format your document so that the key pieces stand out. Use headings, even for short docs, use headings. Um, use fonts sparingly. But for emphasis and focus, um, it's often useful to have italics, bold, and monospace fonts that have a meaning. So for example, variables may be italic. Words that are defined elsewhere in your glossary are bold. And, and config options that we're going to let you copy and paste and should be safe might be monospace. Um, use examples. Use pictures for overview, if that's helpful. Um, add links for related material and for hiding detail. If you have too much detail in a particular section, link to it somewhere else. Um, if you have parallel ideas, use lists. Bullet them out into a list rather than having this one long sentence with loads of semicolons. Um, tables are also great for that. In a vertical list, readers tend to remember about 80% of the material presented versus less than 40% in a paragraph list. Um, numbers versus bullets. If you have to do it in order, use numbers. Otherwise, use bullets. People can get hung up on numbers when they don't need to be. If, if it doesn't matter, it's not an ordered list. It's just we have these features. Just put bullets. Um, and if you're going to refer to items, it might be OK to use numbers for unordered lists. But really, if you're getting above five or six items, you're doing something wrong. Find a way to reorganize it. Um, we have five minutes left. So are there any other questions? Yep. This is a semi-technical question. As, as a developer, you know, I'm comfortable working with source code, making changes, and compiling the code into classes or bytecode. The source code is there. It's very comfortable. Uh, the one thing that always scares me the most about uh, writing uh, reference documentation is 
I'd like to have a serious, similar experience with writing really what I consider the source for the documentation. And that it's not just some big HTML page where I have to do all the HTML tags and everything like that. And I just wonder if maybe there's, there, there are one or two Apache projects out there or anywhere else where they've made it so that for people actually writing the documentation, it's a very similar, comfortable, cut to the chase experience as it would be to write in the source code. Uh, so the question was, are there projects out there that make writing the documentation, particularly for reference documentation, as comfortable? And when you say comfortable, I assume you mean as, as IDE-ish, uh, <laughs> as writing the code. I have to say, yeah, um, I currently work in, uh, in XML primarily and different flavors of XML, and I have IDE-like tools um, that I that I can work in, and unfortunately, I'm one of those people who just prefers to handcraft my XML. I don't know if you guys have any better suggestions. Yeah. Well, I'm not entirely sure you're disagreeing. Um, I think the point. No. Okay. Do, we, do Does anyone have a suggestion for a start? Well, my, yeah. my suggestion is to use an XML DTD or whatever, in which you don't have to write a million tiny tags in order to say things that are better expressed in a more abstract way. Markdown is, Markdown is a good way, yeah. Um, and the CMS, the Apache CMS, allows you to use Markdown. CMS.apache.org. Sorry, one sec. Yep. Oh, Sphinx might be good, especially if you're using. Sphinx might be good. If you guys cannot talk to each other, just so that we can get it on the recording. It's not that I don't want you to talk to each other, but um, an XML DTD was also suggested. Anything else? Yeah, one uh, important thing there might be where you put um, the source code and where you put the documentation. Um, what I've found from uh, HTTPD versus traffic server, in HTTPD we have the um, documentation in the source tree versus ATS where we don't and I think I'm pretty sure it's really better to have it in the tree. Yeah, I think there's broad agreement with that. OK, any last 60 second question? I'll be around all weekend, all week. Uh, I'm pretty easy to spot. So feel free to come and talk to me later. Thank you.